This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie with fifty million reasons why salvation is by faith alone in christ alone by grace alone a sovereign god give faith to man salvation's in the maker's hand this gospel offends rome today they offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome to a new video from Juggler 66, Hour of the Truth. This is another reading of the wonderful book by Philip van Limborch, History of the Inquisition. And the deeper we get in this book, the more I absolutely like it. I only have one little problem that I want to tell you about today on the 7th of April 2017. A few days ago, two days or so, something, I received my delivery from the book that I ordered, History of the Inquisition, Volume 2. I ordered this book as a, uh, as, a, as a copy to hold in my hands, so I thought it would be easier for me to read from that <laughs> hard copy that I hold in my hands uh, when I read to you this book, History of the Inquisition, because you know sometimes it's a little bit smeared with the letters and it's not easy to read, as you can see on the screen, but... Uh, then I got this book sent to me, which I paid 30 euros for, and it was just a print of the PDF. The quality sometimes even worse of that what you see on the screen. I was very much disappointed because I don't have much money, and then uh, when I buy then a book, I really want to have a little bit of quality. But this I could have done myself, printing out the PDF. So my disappointment message to you, mis disappointing message to you is, you have to be satisfied with me reading the PDF, because I will not resort to the book. I put that in the closet and will probably use that for maybe reading in the, in the car when I have some time to prepare here and there a little bit of the reading. I will then later do online, but uh, I have to resort to the PDF because this is even in quality most of the times better than the ones. Uh, the one that was printed there. So I'm very sorry to inform you that that is not very good. So when you look it up on the internet and you buy that book somewhere, I bought it via a website that is called bol.com, B-O-L.com, uh, a, a Dutch site. When you 
come across that book somewhere, be aware that probably the quality is not as good as you expect it to be. Yeah, so you better save your money and just use the PDF, I think. Okay, we're going to continue today on page 100. Um, on the second full paragraph of the page, uh, we see here, I, may, I took a note to continue my reading here. Uh, I left you last time so that you can read uh, about St. Jerome, what he said in page 31, and uh, uh, Amenaeus Marcellinus, the heathen writer, in page 39, that you can read, look that up for you again, for your information again, if you'd like to. That's where we, sto uh, where we stopped last time, the reading. And I will now continue on the second paragraph on page 100 and the PDF, as you see, the PDF page says even with page 101, but you saw the book page above here, that's 100, and the PDF, it's 101 or 127 of 746, whatever. You see where I start reading, the highlighted version here. The author says, I think it will evidently follow from this account that the determinations of councils and the decrees of synods as to matter of faith are of no manner of authority and can carry no obligation upon any Christian whatsoever. I highlighted the sentence because I think this is a sentence we have to a little bit to reflect on. The author says that he thinks it is evidently to follow from the account given before in this book that the determinations of councils means meetings of church hierarchy, of Roman Catholic church hierarchy, of bishops, and other so-called prelates, whatever in the hierarchy are, and also the decrees of synods, other meetings of the churches, most and for all the Roman Catholic Church that we are dealing with here, as to matters of faith are of no manner of authority to any man, meaning the matter of authority to any man should be always the Bible and the Bible alone, sola scriptura. And the author proved with everything he wrote here before, that's why it evidently follows, that determinations of councils, decrees of synods, as to matters of faith, are of no manner of authority and can carry no obligation upon any Christian whatsoever. Here we have to make the distinction, when he says Christian, he means Christian in the biblical sense. No Christian who adheres to the Bible and the Bible alone can ever adhere to any determination of one church council or decree of a synod. The only church council that I can remember there ever was that was of a real apostolic authority that was mentioned in the book of Acts and that was with the apostles. They have had a few councils, at least one that I remember from the reading of the New Testament, maybe even more. But when they held councils, those were councils of authority. But they did not deal to tell the peoples anything in the matters of faith, because they said, what we preach to you is the gospel of Jesus Christ, as it is written right now. They were making history when they went along. The Roman Catholic Church does not ever make history. It uh, suppresses history and it writes its own history. But I absolutely agree with the author. Determinations of church councils and decrees of synods, decrees of synods have no obligation or carry no obligation to, as to matters of faith upon any Christian who claims for himself Sola Scriptura, whatsoever. The author continues in the second sentence. I will not mention here one reason which would be self-sufficient if all others were wanting. This means 
that they have no power given them in any part of the gospel revelation to make these decisions in controverted points and to oblige others to subscribe them and that therefore the, the, uh, the pretense to it is an usurpation of what belongs to the great God who only hath and can have a right to prescribe to the consciences of men. Here the author says what I just said. Your conscience lies with God and he is the only one who has a right to prescribe even to your conscience because he made it. God made your conscience because God made man. And there is no church hierarchy that has any legal authority over your conscience. Except, of course, you give it up. But the, another word the author uses here is the usurpation. Yeah? The Roman Catholic Church usurps what belongs to the great God and makes it her own but only when people adhere to it, only when people obey that church, the church has the power to do that. But the people believe that church and obey that church because they do not know history and they do not know their Bible anymore. <clears throat> but to let this pass, what one council can be fixed upon that will appear to be compo uh, composed of such persons as upon an impartial examination can be allowed to be fit for the work of settling the faith and determining all controversies relating to it. I mean, in which the majority of the members may, in charity, be supposed to be disinterested, wise, learned, peaceable and pious men. Will any man undertake to affirm this of the Council of Nicaea? Can anything be more evident than that the members of, the vener of that venerable assembly came, many of them full of passion and resentment, that others of them were crafty and wicked, and others ignorant and weak? Did their meeting together in the synod immediately cure them of their desire and reven of revenge, make the wicked virtues of the ig or the ignorant wise? Did that happen in the Council of Nicaea? In 320, when was it? 323 something? Uh, 325, sorry. Did their meeting together in a synod immediately cure them of their desire of revenge, make the wicked virtuous or the ignorant wise? <laughs> if not, their joint decree as a synod could really be of no more weight than their private opinions, nor perhaps of so much because it is well known that the great transactions of such assemblies are generally managed and conducted by a few, and that authority, persuasion, prospect of interest and other temporal motives are commonly made use of to secure a majority. That's the point. And the majority is always wrong. Shall we read that sentence again? If not, their decree as a synod could really be of no more weight than their private opinions. Nor perhaps of so much because it is well known that the great transactions of such assemblies, the great transactions of such assemblies as synods and councils are generally managed and conducted by a few and that, the, uh, the, uh, that authority, persuasion, prospect of interest and other temporal motives are commonly made use of to secure a majority. Means a few in the hierarchy tell the majority what to do. That's the way the cookie crumbles. Eh? The Orthodox have taken care to destroy all the accounts given of this council by those of the opposite party, and Eusebius, Bishop of Caesarea, have passed it over in the silence, in silence, and only dropped two or three hints that are very far from being favorable to those reverend fathers. In a word, nothing can be collected from friends or enemies to induce one to believe that they had any of those qualifications which were necessary to fit them for the province they had undertaken, 
of settling the peace of the Church by a fair, candid and impartial determination of the controversy that divided it, so that the Emperor Constantine and Socrates the historian took the most effectual method to vindicate their honor by pronouncing them inspired by the Holy Ghost which they had great need of to make up the want of all other qualifications. That's the First Council. The Second General Council were plainly the creatures of the Emperor Theodosius, all of his own party, and convened to do as he bid them, which they did by confirming the Nicene Creed in the first place, so the First Council was confirmed at the second, and condemning all heresies. The Third General Council were the creatures of Cyril, who was their president and the uh, inveterate enemy of Nestorius, whom he condemned for heresy and was himself condemned for his rashness in this affair and excommunicated by, bishop of, by the bishop of Antioch. The fourth council met under the oars of the emperor Martian, managed their debates with noise and tumults, were formed into a majority by the intrigues of the legates of Rome, and settled the faith by the opinions of Athanasius, Cyril and others. I need not mention more, the farther we go, the worse they, the councils, will appear. How many, it is not be asked, how came the few bishops who met by command of Theodosius to be, uh, to be styled an ecumenical or general council? As they came to decree, as he decreed they should, what authority with any wise man can their decisions have? As they were all of one side, except 36 of the Macedonian, uh, Macedonian party, who were afterwards added, what less could be expected but that they would decree themselves orthodox, establish their own creed, and anathematize all others for heretics? Which is this? They are making up their own religion. They are making up their own rules to their own religion. Establish their own creeds and anathematize all others for heretics, all others who do not believe in their creed. And as to the next council, I confess I can pay no respect or reverence to a set of clergy met under the direction and influence of a man of Cyril's principles and morals especially as the main transaction of that council was hurried on by a desire of revenge, and done before the arrival of the bishop of Antioch with the suffragan brethren, and condemned by him as soon as he was informed of it, till at length the power and influence of the emperor reconciled the two haughty prelates, made them reverse their mutual excommunications, decree the same doctrine, and join in pronouncing the same anathemas. Cannot anyone discern more of resentment and pride in their first quarrel than of a regard to touch uh, to truth and peace, and more of, compli uh, of complacence to the emperor than of concern for the honor of Christ in their after reconciliation? And as to the next council. Let anyone but read over the account given of it by Evagrius. What horrible confusions there were amongst them! How they were, uh, how they threw about anathemas and curses! How they fathered their violences uh, on Christ! How they settled the faith by the doctrines of Athanasius, Cyril, and other fathers! And if he can bring himself to pay any reference to their decree, I envy him not the submission he pays them, nor the rule by which he guides and determines his beliefs. I confess, I cannot read the amount of these transactions. They are ascribing their anathemas and curses to Christ and the Holy Trinity, and their decisions as to the faith, to the Holy Ghost, without indignation at the horrid abuse of those sacred names. Their very meeting to pronounce damnation from their adversaries, 
and to form creeds for the consciences of others is no less than a demonstration that they had no concurrence of the Son of God, no influence of the Holy Spirit of God at all. The faith was already settled for them, and for all other Christians in the sacred writings, and needed no decision of councils to explain and amend it. The very attempt was insolence and usurpation. Infallibility is a necessary qualification for an office to such, of such importance. Infallibility is a necessary qualification for an office of such importance. That's why, a few years later, in 1817, with the First Vatican Council, the Pope was made infallible, declared infallible by canon law. When he speaks ex cathedra, meaning on doctrine and faith subjects from his throne. Infallibility is a necessary qualification for an office of such importance. But what promise is there made to councils of this divine gift? Or, if there should be any such promise made to them, yet the method of their debates, their scandalous arts to defame their adversaries, and the contradictions they decreed for truth and gospel proofs to the v uh, Oh, to the fullest, sorry, <laughs> and proves to the fullest conviction that they forfeited the grace of it. And indeed, if the fruits of the Spirit are love, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and meekness, there appeared few or no signs of them in any of the councils. This is the most important sentence what I have read today. If the fruits of the Spirit are love, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness and meekness, and this is exactly what the Bible describes, there appeared few or even no signs of them in any of the councils. So, in conclusion, none of these councils, none of these synods ever was led by the Holy Spirit. You can also say by their fruits you will know them. Indeed, if the fruits of the Spirit are the points I addressed, love, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness and meekness, the fruits of the synods or councils must be the same but there appeared few or even no signs of them in all the councils. So these councils are not led by the Holy Spirit. So why should I adhere to anything that is not even led by the Holy Spirit when I adhere to the Bible and the Bible alone? And the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, and my Father in Heaven is my guide of conscience. The soil was too rank and hot to produce them. I wish, the author continues, for the honour of the former times, I could give a better account of these assemblies of the clergy, and, <coughs> and see reason to believe myself that they were, generally speaking, men of integrity. I wish I could say they were men of integrity, they were men of wisdom, candour, moderation and virtue. The debates of such men would have deserved regard and their opinions would have challenged a proper reverence. But, even had this been the case, their opinions could have been no rule to, order to others. And how great a veneration soever we might have had for their characters we ought, as men and Christians, to have examined their principles. There is one rule superior to them and us by which Christians are to try all doctrines and spirits. Yeah? We have to try and question every spirit. Right? If that would have been done in the sentence that I highlighted here in yellow, then we wouldn't have had that many councils and synods. But the people were falling back into reality and not into the teachings of men. 
there's one rule superior to them, meaning the Roman Catholic hierarchy, by which Christians are to try all doctrines and spirits, the decision of which is more sacred than, of, uh, than that of all human wisdom and authority, and everywhere and in all ages obligatory. But as the ancient councils consisted of men of quite other dispositions, and as their decisions in matters of faith were arbitrary and unwarranted, and as those decisions themselves were generally owing to court practices, intriguing statesmen, the thirst of revenge, the management of a few crafty interested bishops to noise and tumult, the prospects and hopes of promotions and translations, and other the like causes and reverence paid them by many Christians is truly surprising, and I cannot account for it in any way but one, meaning that those who thus cry, who thus cry up their authority are in hopes of uh, succeeding them in their power and therefore would fain, per, uh, would fain pers, uh, persuade others that their decrees are sacred and binding to make way for the imposing of their own. It would be well worth the while of some of these council mongers to lay down some proper rules and distinctions by which we may judge what councils are to be received and which to be rejected, and particularly why the four first general councils should be submitted to in presence to all others. Councils have often decreed contrary to councils, and the same bishops have decreed different things in different councils. And even the third and fourth general councils determined the use of the word person in an infinitely different sense from what the first two did. Heretical councils, as they are called, have been more in number than some orthodox general ones, called by the same imperial authority, have claimed the same powers, pretended to the same influence of the Holy Ghost, and pronounced the same anathemas against principles and persons. By what criteria or, mar uh, or certain marks, then, must we judge which of these councils are thieving, general, particular, orthodox, Liter uh, her heretical and which not. The councils themselves must not be judges in their own cause. For when we must receive or reject, for then we must receive or reject them all. What does the author say here? Read it again. The councils themselves must not be judges in their own cause. For then we must receive or reject them all. That's what I do. I reject them all. Because they are not councils of the Church of God. Of the body of Christ. But here the author says of course. Well when the bishops of these different councils. Lift themselves up to be the judges of the council themselves. What judgment can there be? No right just judgment, right? So then all councils must be received or reject or rejected. The characters of the bishops that composed them will not uh, sorry, the characters of the bishops that composed them will not do. For their characters seem equally amiable and Christian on each side. The nature of the doctrine as decreed by them is far from being a safe rule, because if human authority or church power makes truth in any, in any case, it makes it in every case. And therefore upon this, f uh, upon this foot the decrees at Tyre and Ephesus are as truly binding as those at Nicaea and Chalcedon. Or... If we must judge of the councils by the nature of the doctrine abstracted from all human authority, those councils can have no authority at all. Every man must fit, must, and every man must sit in judgment over them and try them by reason 
and scripture and reject and receive them just as he would do the opinions of any other persons whatsoever. And I humbly conceive they should have no better treatment because they deserve none. Point 5. If then the decrees of the fathers and councils, if the decisions of human authority and matters of religion are of no avail, and carry with them no obligation, it follows that the imposing subscriptions to creeds and articles of faith as tests of orthodoxy is a thing unreasonable in itself, as it hath proved to infinite ill consequence in the Church of God. I call it an unreasonable custom, not only because where there is no power to make creeds for others, there can be no right to impose them, but because no one of, uh, because no one good reason can be assigned for the use and continuance of this practice. For, as my Lord Bishop of London admirably well explains this matter, quote, As long as men are men, and have different degrees of understanding, and every one a partiality of, to his own conceptions, it is not to be expected that they should agree in any one entire scheme and every part of it in the circumstances as well as in the substance in the matter of things, as well as in the things themselves. The question therefore is not in general about a difference in opinion, which in our present state is unavoidable, but about the weight and importance of the things wherein Christians differ and the things wherein they agree. And it will appear that, uh, that the several denominations of Christians agree both in the substance of religion and in the necessary enforcements of the practice of it. That the world and all things in it were created by God and are under the direction and government of his all-powerful hand and under the a government of his all-seeing eye, that there is an essential difference between God and evil, uh, between good and evil, that there is a essential difference between virtue and vice, that there will be a state of future rewards and punishments according to our behavior in this life, that Christ was a teacher sent from God, and that his apostles were divinely inspired that all Christians are bound to declare and profess themselves to be his disciples, that not only the exercise of several virtues, but also a belief in Christ is necessary in order to their obtaining the pardon of sin, the favor of God, and eternal life with it, that the worship of God is to be performed chiefly by the heart, in prayers, in praises, and in thanksgiving, and as to all other points, that they are bound to live by the rules which Christ and his apostles have left them in the Holy Scriptures. Here then, adds the learned bishop, is a fixed, certain and uniform rule of faith and practice, containing all the most necessary points of religion established by a divine sanction, embraced as such by all denominations of Christians, and in itself abundantly sufficient to preserve the knowledge and practice of religion in the world. As to points, um, as to points of greater intricacy, intricacy, and which require uncommon degrees of penetration and knowledge, such indeed have been subjects of dispute amongst persons and study of learning in the several ages of the Christian Church. But the people are not obliged to enter into them, so long as they do not touch the foundations of Christianity, nor have an influence upon practice. In other points, it is sufficient that they believe the doctrines so far as they find, upon due inquiry and examination according to their several, uh, several abilities and opportunities that God hath revealed them. Very important last sentence. Let's read it again. In other points, it is sufficient 
that they believe the doctrine so far as they find upon due inquiry and examination according to their several abilities and opportunities, opportunities that God hath revealed them. It is sufficient that they believe doctrines that God hath revealed them. That is the point the sentence wants to make. And very important to understand it this way. What this bishop that we've just cited here said is absolutely according to what Jesus Christ said. Is absolutely according to what the Bible teaches. Now this incomparable passage of this reverend and truly charitable prelate I have transcribed entire because it will undoubtedly give a sanction to my own principles and universal benevolence and charity. His Lordship affirms that, quote, all denominations of Christians, and he will allow me to mention a few of them, like the Socinians, the Arians, the Athanasians, the Sabellians, the Pelagians, the Arminians, the Calvinists, the Episcopalians, Presbyterians, Independents and the Baptists, and probably also the Lutherans, and so on, all agree in the substance of religion and in the necessary enforcement of the practice of it. Unquote. Inasmuch as they do all believe firmly and sincerely those principles which his lordship calls with great reason and truth a fixed certain and uniform rule of faith and practice as containing all the most necessary points of religion, and in itself abundantly sufficient to preserve the knowledge and practice of religion in the world. My inference from this noble concession, for which all the friends to liberty and church and state throughout Great Britain will thank his lordship, is this, that since all denominations of Christians do, in his lordship's judgment, receive his fixed, certain and uniform rule of faith, and embrace all the most necessary points of religion to impose subscriptions and articles of faith and human creed, must be a very unreasonable and needless thing. For either such article and creeds contain nothing more than this same rule of faith and practice, and then all subscriptions to them is impertinent, because this is already received by all denominations of Christians and is abundantly sufficient by the bishop's own allowance to preserve the knowledge and practice of religion in the world. Or such articles and creeds containing something more than his lordship's fixed rule of faith and practice, something more than all the most necessary points of religion, something more than is sufficient to preserve the knowledge and practice of religion in the world i.e. some very unnecessary points of religion. Something on which the preservation of religion doth not depend. And of consequence subscriptions to unnecessary articles of faith on which religion doth not depend can never be necessary to qualify any person for a minister of, uh, of the Church of Christ and therefore not for the Church of England if that be part of the Church of Christ. And this is the more unnecessary because, as his lordship father well observes, the people are not obliged to enter into them so long as they do not touch the foundations of Christianity, meaning, so far as his lordship certain fixed the uniform rule, which contains all necessary points of religion, is not affected by them. And if the people are not obliged to enter the, uh, into points of great intricacy and dispute, I humbly conceive the clergy cannot be obliged to preach them, and that the consequences it is absurd to impose upon the subscriptions of, to such things as to oblige them to subscribe what they need not preach, nor any of their people believe. Upon his lordship's principles, the imposing subscriptions to the hard unscriptural expressions of the Athanasians and Arians, by each party in their turns, and to the thirty-nine articles of the Church of England, must be a very unreasonable and unchristian thing, 
because the peculiarities to be subscribed do not one of them enter into this specified points of religion and are not necessary to preserve religion in the world and after so public a declaration of charity towards all denominations of christians and the safety of religion and the church upon the general principles he hath laid down there is no reason to doubt but his lordship will use that power and influence with god hath in, uh, which god hath entrusted him him with to remove the wall of separation in the established church in order to the uniting all differing sects all denominations of christians in one visible communion and that he will join in that most christian and catholic prayer of one of his own brethren though disapproved of by another of narrower principle blessed be they who have contributed to so good a work now this was quite a interesting and very long sentence again sometimes i really don't like it when the sentences are so long because you start to lose focus on the real message in this so i'm gonna read this last sentence to you one again once again upon his lordship's principles the imposing subscriptions to the hard unscriptural expressions of the Athan uh, athanasians and arians by each party in their turns and to the 39 articles of the church of england which by the way are not very great points because i read them and they are more catholic than they are biblical but they are a compromise the 39 articles of the church of the anglican church um, must be a very reasonable and unchristian thing because the peculiarities peculiarities to be subscribed do not one of them enter into this specified person points of religion and are not necessary to preserve religion in the world and after so public a declaration of charity towards all denominations of christians and the safety of religion and church upon to general principles he hath uh, he hath laid down there is no reason to doubt but his lordship will use that power and influence with god hath entrusted in him with to remove the wall of separation in the established church in order to the uniting all differing sects and denominations of christians in one visible communion and that he will join in that most christian and catholic prayer one of his own brethren though disapproved of by another of narrower principle blessed be they who have contributed to so good a work the sentence that i've just read is on the foundation of the ecumenical movement that we um, ecumenical movement that we have seen since Vatican II, the 1960s. Subscriptions have never been a grievance in the Church of God, and the first introduction of them was owing to pride and the claim of an unrighteous and ungodly power. Neither the warrant of Scripture nor the interest of truth made them necessary. Tis, I think, but by few, if any, pretended that the sacred writings countenance this practice. They do indeed abound with directions and exhortations to adhere steadfastly to the faith, not to be moved from the faith, nor tossed about with every wind of doctrine. But what is the faith which we are to adhere to? what the faith established and stamped for orthodox by the bishops and councils ridiculous it was the case our faith must be as various as their creeds and as absurd and contradictory as their decisions no the faith we are to be grounded and settled in is that which was at once delivered to the saints, the apostles, that which was preached by the apostles to the Gentiles, as well as the Jews. The wholesome world, the wholesome words, we are to consent to, uh, the wholesome words we are to consent to are the words of our Lord jesus christ and the doctrine which is according to godliness 
Now I'm going to repeat this last sentence because I butchered that a little bit, but this is really important that we get this. Here he absolutely tells us that all these councils are worthless and have absolutely no authority and power over anybody, or at least should not have in that case. Okay? Let's read it again. The last little paragraph here. They do indeed abound with directions and exhortations to adhere steadfastly to the faith, not to be moved from the faith, nor tossed about with every wind of doctrine. But what is the faith which we are to adhere to? What is the faith which we are to adhere to? Now it follows. What the faith established and stamped for the Orthodox by bishops and councils? No! Not that one. It was the case our faith must be as various as their creeds and as absurd and contradictory as their decisions. No! The faith we are to be grounded and settled in. This is the point the author wants to make here. Are we to listen to the bishops and the councils? If that was the case, we must be as various as their creeds, which have the second council disproving the first, the fourth disproving the third, and so on. No, the faith we are grounded and settled in is that which was at once delivered to the saints, that which was preached by the apostles to the Gentiles, as well as to the Jews. The wholesome words we are to consent to are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine which is according to godliness. That's what we are adhere to. Not councils, not bishops, not any men who take any power that we have not given them. This all genuine Christians receive out of regard to a much higher authority than belongs to any set of men in the world. And therefore, the sanction of fathers and councils in this case is as impertinent as a man's pretending to give a sanction to the constitutions of the great God. And as to all other articles of faith, neither they nor any others have any commission to impose them on the consciences of man. And the moment they attempt to do it, they cease to be servants of the house of God and act as the true and proper lords of the heritage. Very important sentence that I hope that you followed a little bit with me. We adhere to Jesus Christ and the doctrines of him and of the saints. This all genuine Christians receive. And they know that there is no higher authority but God. They receive that out of regard to a much higher authority that belongs to any set of men in the world, meaning no any set nor any set of men here in the world can be of any higher authority than that of the great God who made the constitutions of faith. And as to all other articles of faith, so whether it's the 39 articles of the Anglican Church or whatever, neither they nor any others have any commission to impose them on the consciences of men. Meaning they have no right, they have no power to be imposed upon the consciences of men. Because men's consciences Conscience must be guided by God, and by God alone, not by men. And the movement they attempt to, the moment they attempt to do it, they cease to be servants in the house of God and act as the true proper lords of the heritage. You know, we can even combine this what I've just read here with Romans 13. Because when the powers that be assume authority that is not given to them by God, they make up their own authority, that is the moment when I have to let loose, when I cannot go along with it anymore. And this is exactly what the author says here. 
the moment they attempt to do this, meaning to impose their conscience upon other men, the moment they attempt to do this, they cease to be the servants in the house of God. Because then they serve themselves. They are not serving Jesus Christ anymore. Now the author continues, but it may be said that the church hath power to determine in, con uh, in, in controversies of faith, so as not to decree anything against scripture, nor to enforce anything to be believed as necessary to salvation besides it. Meaning, I suppose the church has power to guard the truths of scripture, and in any controversies about doctrines to determine what is or is not agreeable to scripture, and to enforce the reception of what they thus decree by obliging others to subscribe to their decisions. If this be the case, then it necessarily follows that their determinations must be ever right and constantly agreeable to the doctrine of Holy Writ, and that they ought never to determine but when they are in right and are sure they are right, they are in the right, because if the matter be difficult in its nature, or the clergy have any doubts and scruples concerning it, or are liable to make false decisions, they cannot, with any reason, make a final decision, because this possible they may decide on the wrong side of the question, and thus decree falsehood instead of truth. And I presume there are but few who will claim, in words, so extraordinary a power as that of establishing falsehood in the room of truth and scripture. Well, there's one, the Pope. And even supposing their decisions to be right, how will it follow that they have a power to oblige others to submit to and subscribe to them? If by sound reason and argument they can convince the consciences of others, they are sure of the agreement of all such with them in principle. And upon this foot subs... subs uh, Oh, sorry, this uh, there's again a word that I have troubles reading. I, uh, subs, subscriptions, yeah, sorry, that was the word. That's why I didn't see it before. Yeah. If by sound reason and argument they can convince the conscience of others, they are sure of the agreement of all such with them in the principle, and upon this foot subscriptions are wholly useless. And if they cannot convince them, it is a very unrighteous thing to impose subscriptions on them, and a shameful prevarication with God and man for, an, an, for any to submit to them without it. Decisions made in controversies of faith by the clergy carry in them no force nor even evidence of truth. Let their office be ever so sacred, it doth not exempt them from human frailties and imperfections. A better sense against papal infallibility could not have been written here. Decisions made in controversies of faith by the clergy carry in them no force nor evidence of truth. Let their office be ever so sacred, it doth not exempt them from human frailties and imper imperfections. So when these clergy mean that they have so a quote-unquote sacred office and they cannot fail, the author absolutely rejects that and says, of course they can fail, because they have failed in the past, because the uh, one council spoke against the other council, so they can't all be right. And if not all be right, then all are wrong. And if all are wrong, why do we adhere to them anyway? Good question, eh? How then, the author continues, how then can the clergy leave any authority in controversies of faith which the laity have not? And this is where the Bible jumps in. We are all brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. We are all equal in the body of Christ, in truth, in the truth of the Bible, we are all the same. 
and we are all one. There is no clergy that has any authority in the body of Christ, in the true body of Christ. We are all the same. We are all bishops. We are all quote-unquote popes in the body of Christ. There is no hierarchy amongst us, brethren. But Jesus is the head of the church. And the Father is on top of it all. But we are all the same. Clergy or non-clergy. Clergy does not have any authority in controversies of faith, which the laity have not. That is biblical teaching. We are all the same. Martin Luther wrote about this in 1540 in the Babylonian captivity of the church. And uh, maybe you should take that pic that uh, document out sometimes and, and, and read that and study that for yourself. That is exactly what Martin Luther says there. Um, he says that in that part of uh, what he wrote to the German nobility in 1520. And I made uh, three broadcasts on that in Hour of the Truth in the past. So you can go to the archives on Hour of the Truth and see where I read Luther's letter to the German nobility and um, then you can look that up and you will understand that we are all the same how then can the clergy leave have sorry how then can the clergy have any authority in controversies of faith which a laity have not they can't it's just simple as that they can't that they have erred in their decisions and decreed light to be darkness and darkness light that they have perplexed the consciences of men and corrupted the simplicity of the faith in Christ all their counsels and synods are a notorious proof with what justice or modesty then can they pretend to a power of obliging others to believe their articles or subscribe them if I was to speak the real truth, it will be found that those numerous opinions which have been anathematized as heretical and which have broken the Christian world into parties have been generally invented and broached and propagated by the clergy. Witness Arius, Macedonius, Nestorius, Eutychus, Dioscorus and others, and therefore if we may judge by any observations made by the uh, on the rise of heresy what is in a, uh, what is a proper method to put a stop to the progress of it it cannot be the clergy's forming articles of faith and forcing others to subscribe to them because this is the very method by which they have established and propagated it now let me tell you one little thing before I come to an end here. What I just read here is the early disagreement that you had in the church, right? You had the teachings of Arius, Macedonius, Nestorius, Eutychius, Dioscorus and even others that are not mentioned here. And all were teaching other things. And all were saying that they taught the word of God. Well, the word of God is only in one teaching, and that is the Bible. And what the author says here is already the, the, um, an early sign of the compartmentalization that we see today within the Christian church, so-called Christian church, in the so-called Protestant churches. Why there are so many quote-unquote denominations in the Christian or Protestant churches because everyone teaches something else but if everyone teaches something else they cannot all teach the word of God because that's only one teaching they have all right and it cannot be the clergy's forming articles of faith and forcing others to subscribe to them. No, but people believe this. There are people who believe the Calvinists, people who believe the Lutherans, people who believe the Methodists, people who believe the Baptists, people who believe the Pentecostals, people who believe the Seventh-day Adventists. They all make up their own religious system instead of really adhering to the Bible where we all are the same. 
This is the very method by which it has been established and propagated. So I want to stop my reading right here and uh, postpone the next reading to the next time. It's almost an hour and um, I think it was, this was quite heavy what we've just read all about. But we really have to understand this very last sentence. Therefore, if we may judge by any observations made on the rise of heresy, what's a proper method to put a stop to the progress of it, it cannot be the clergy's forming articles of faith and forcing others to subscribe them. Forcing others. That's the most important point. You cannot force others to subscribe to your point of view. Because this is the very method by which they have established and propagated it. This is, this is how the Roman Catholic Church came into existence. Forced others to subscribe to their belief system. And this is what she still does today. This is what she always has done. And what she always will do in the future. The Roman Catholic Church is the prime example of what we are talking here in this book. History of the Inquisition by Philip van Limborch. And I urge you to get a copy of this book and read it for yourself if you find my reading not so, well, easy to follow, maybe. I don't care, I'm going to read it anyway, because I love this book and I love to analyze it and I love to read this. And I love to understand this and see actually a lot of the history of the Roman Catholic Church being put into this book. How the clergy is made a quote-unquote super race above the so-called layman. That's what we have today. Always authority, authority, authority. Yeah, We always place ourselves under authority. Well, let's place ourselves under one authority and one authority only. The authority of God and his written word. All the other authorities are assumptions by man, usurped by man, taken from God and people making themselves God through a hierarchy that should never be existing in this world. And of course, when you are not subscribing to that authority, that self-styled authority, then you will be persecuted. And that's what this whole book is all about. History of the Inquisition. Persecution. And next time, we will go on reading until then, Jogda 66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off, says God bless you and bye bye.